back. John, did you paint that artwork behind you? No, no, I just found it on the on the web somewhere. It's beautiful. <laughs> <sighs> we'll just give people a minute. We'll we'll start with announcements. We don't have a lot of announcements today, um, and then we'll we'll switch over. So, just give people a minute. <sighs> So the council met the other day and we're, we're optimistic for 2022 <laughs> in person. Well, we're literally thinking about January, try, starting to try and secure a date for January, 2022. Um, mm. So um, that's where our thinking is. Um, and uh, as you probably know, we're no longer going to be at the Natural History Museum. You know, we were graciously hosted there by the Natural History Museum because we had a sponsor, which was Gordon Hendler, and we still do have him, and he's still a supporter of lambs, but the um, museum has been renovating, or at least planning renovation, and that, that's our space that's getting renovated. So we're looking at other locations and, um, it's not going to be easy and it probably won't suit everyone. That's uh, really hard so far to find the perfect spot, but um, we will be relocating and that's our plan. When this happened a long time ago as well, didn't we end up at the Arboretum for a, for a few years? Well, I wasn't In there about 1980? then, Don is on and you know, one of the <laughs> former presidents, Don, uh, is here and he might remember <laughs> something from way in the past. It was right about 1980 to 82. I, I, I don't remember. Well, well of course, I've been at the back. museum for 10 years, which is roughly how long I've been with Lambs, maybe only nine years. Um, so they moved there not long after, uh, before I joined. And um, so, yeah, they'd been elsewhere before that, and we'll, we'll see what works. I'm optimistic. Well, we're a couple minutes in here, so um, I'll go ahead and just make the announcement that um, uh, <clears throat> we are having our annual election, and we'll be posting a call for nominations. Uh, this is an annual event where all seats in the Lambs Council are up for grabs. Um, many of the, many, but not all of the same current um, people are interested in those positions. But we also welcome people to come in and uh, look um, at um, maybe getting involved and, and taking on one of these positions and running for that position. So the ones that we are particularly interested in trying to fill is the first of all is possibly the most important position at LAMS, which is the secretary. And based on the bylaws, um, you can't have a LAMS council meeting without the secretary. I think you can do it without the president, but I don't think you can do it without the secretary. It's an important position. It's also a position of responsibility and work. Uh, we've been so lucky to have Emily Sy uh, filling that position for the last few years, but Emily is, isn't going to be able to keep doing it due to other commitments. And so this, for example, involves taking the coming to the meetings or by Zoom, uh, but being available, taking notes, recording, and actually producing the minutes, which are the official summary of the meeting that gets recorded by LAMS and is there for posterity. And so um, that's a position that requires that person to be there every time 
and to follow up the meeting and to produce the minutes. The minutes get reviewed by the board members and then it goes back to the secretary. So it's, it's actually one of the harder jobs. And I just want to take this moment to thank Emily for doing such a great job for uh, these past few years because it really is an important position. So thank you, Emily. Um, and uh, the other position that's um, been open for the past few years, it's been unfilled and we don't have to fill all of the seats, but it's the field chair position is still open. And we have still had field trips and um, Steve Pencall has been the field trip, trip chair in the past. He did lead a walk recently, so thank you, Steve. I haven't heard about the results of that yet. It's been dry, but sometimes there are surprises. So I'd like to hear about that. Um, and so um, the, and I see a nomination for Bat Varde uh, coming from Amanda. So thank you, Amanda. Um, and I will take that into note and we'll be putting out the call. It's just one of our emails that you'll get that uh, you'll see call for nominations. And then a month from now, there'll actually be a ballot. Um, you've also noticed that there's been a call for a special meeting and the special meeting is to change the bylaws to allow um, electronic voting, which makes it easier for everyone to vote. And so we don't know the results of that yet, but regardless, there will be an election and you'll, you're all eligible if you're members to be able to vote. You're all eligible to self-nominate um, yourself for a position. And also um, please feel free to contact me or other people about you know, what's involved in these different things. And we'll be putting together a little summary, an informal summary of what um, people do. So, um, so there's that. Um, do we have any other announcements? No other announcements? I didn't think so. So if that's true, I'd like to go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Zachary Mazai. So uh, Zachary is a classically trained French chef and he's going to be talking to us tonight about cooking mushrooms from Thailand. Uh, he has a love for uh, Nouveau American cuisine as well as cuisine of the Pacific Northwest. He currently lives in Northern Thailand uh, and there he's the owner chef of Food Blender. He's also currently working on a cookbook and he's actively investigating mycophagy and I, I assume primarily in, in Northern Thailand, but probably other places as well. And so tonight's program is edible mushrooms of the Lana kingdom. And I believe uh, Rich is going to, just to summarize, I believe we're going to turn off chat so that only the moderators can see it. I also posted an email if you want to email. Um, Rich, is that true? Do you want to summarize the Zoom settings for tonight? Well, we'll go ahead and uh, turn off the chat and uh, we'll, we'll keep it so people can't uh, unmute. But then at the end of the talk, we'll um, we'll open it up again. Okay, great. So we're trying to minimize disruptions. So I go ahead and turn it over to Zachary. Zachary, thank you for awesome. coming. I assume you're in Thailand right now, but I don't actually even know. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in the presentation. Um, okay. But uh, first thing, can, can everyone hear me? Uh, the, this yes. configuration of the computer is a little farther than I'm used to, but um, great. I mean, I'll, I'm happy to get right into it. Otherwise, I start giving away secrets before I start. Um, let's see. So I need to uh, be able to share my screen, though. You yeah, got right. it now. Go ahead and try. Okay. Ready to go. Awesome. Cool. Well, first off, man, thank you guys so much for having me. I, uh, I sent a bunch of messages, I think, in 
August or September of last year and the LA group responded. They're like, oh yeah, we've got a place in April. I was like, April is so far from now. Uh, and here we are. And I'm happy to say that I've, uh, I've been presenting this talk since last August. And part of my, my own ethos for presentations is to constantly update it so that nobody gets the same presentation. And so you guys being at the very end are getting uh, a quite an updated and edited and changed up presentation from where it started. So uh, happy about that. Uh, my name is Zachary Mozzi, as, uh, as I was introduced. Um, I grew up in Oregon and um, went to chef school in Oregon as well in Portland um, and uh, have been in the industry for, for a long time, actually 26 years since first frying French fries and washing dishes. Um, and uh, now being in Thailand where I can't work, I've been mostly doing some writing. So this is sort of one of those projects. So you may be asking, where's the Mana Kingdom? I thought we were talking about Thailand. Uh, Northern Thailand uh, it comprises of about nine provinces, what is, what is considered the, the Lana Kingdom. Lana actually means a million rice fields. And it really is, it's just rice fields as far as the eye can see. As you can see, Chiang Mai, there uh, in Lampun, those are the large cities. But this is this is from uh, the 1200s. You know, this is Lana is a very proud and was its own kingdom for for several hundred years before becoming uh, a vassal state of Burma, and then eventually. Fiercely independent. Uh, it has its own language. It has its own customs. It has its own culture. Um, and as you can see. Here are the, the general areas that people will visit in Thailand, um, as you, one being Bangkok, the rest being beaches and islands, and then way up there at the top in the mountains is Chiang Mai. Um, the climate up there is actually is pretty, is pretty incredible. It's um, from pine forests all the way down to uh, subtropical mountains. Um, I'm actually currently at number nine in Thailand. Uh, we came down here, Chiang Mai being in those valleys also collects a lot of smoke from burning. It's a, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty terrible thing. One of the seasons is literally called smoky season and it's the worst air pollution in the world for, can be up to three months. Um, and a lot of, a lot of Chiang Mai'ers flee to Southern Thailand around that time, which is what we did. Uh, and then we are now experiencing our third COVID wave in Thailand. And this one's uh, the most serious so far. And Chiang Mai is one of the epicenters. So we are quite comfortable down here on the islands uh, for a little while. Um, Although I'm, I'm told the smoke season is gone and mushroom season has begun. So now it's like, okay, <laughs> what do we do next? Anyway, I, I am down here in, uh, in, in Koh Lanta currently, but I do live in Chiang Mai. Um, this is a uh, little movie from Google, Google Earth to uh, give you a like, view of the mountains here. So uh, I did get a degree in geology many lives ago. And what I like to say about Southeast Asia is it's, it's sort of the toothpaste uh, the toothpaste coming out of the tube from the Indian subcontinent slamming into the Asian continent, which is what's creating the Himalayas. And if you look at the map, you see these long mountain formations that roll really long ridges um, that create really interesting valleys, uh, real, uh, quite awesome river systems. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Chiang Mai is where it is, uh, is it is actually accessible by river from Bangkok. Um, Computer is moving slowly. Come on, guys. Uh, anyway, um, I'm not sure what's happening with this freezing thing. Um, so yeah, I got to Chiang Mai because 2020 happened. We actually came here to Southern Thailand in February of last year. Oh, there it is. All right, hang on. Uh, we came here to Thailand in 2020 in February and at that time everyone's like don't go you have no idea what this thing is gonna this COVID thing is gonna blow up you're gonna be in the wrong place and in fact it did but it turned out we we're in the right place um, we uh, be my Tamada means a, a not normal year. <laughs> uh, so we came for 10 weeks. We are going on a year and a half now. And uh, we luckily we are about to move to Mexico. We packed up our stuff, uh, our, both our houses in Portland and in San Francisco respectively uh, and had no rent. And so it, it's, been, it's been quite an adventure here. Um, so what happened was I dropped into the Lana Kingdom with no expectations. I, I wasn't, 
I didn't come for the food. I didn't come for the mushrooms. I was here sort of uh, accidentally. And as a chef, I immediately dove in. And so I want to share with you today what I've learned about the Lana Kingdom and the Lana mushrooms. And uh, we'll start with some language. Um, so first of all, Lana food is not Thai food. Uh, Northern Thai food culture is defined by all kinds of uh, interests from all over the Southeast Asian Peninsula, um, as well as hill tribes that have uh, sort of moved separate, uh, different from the boundaries, they sort of move freely. Um, and as I said, it was at one point it was Burma, it is surrounded by Laos and uh, close to Cambodia, Vietnam, of course, China has had a huge influence. There's a, several Chinese settlements along the border. Um, and then colonizers, although Thailand was never colonized, uh, there was quite the, quite the number of Westerners that were, have been here for several hundred years as well, uh, as well as Muslim influence from Malaysia and Indian uh, influence as well. And in the modern day, uh, Ch Chiang Mai, which is a really amazing city, is really influenced by the Westerners and global ties. Thais are traveling more and more, they're bringing back more and more culture. And in Chiang Mai, it would be hard pressed to find uh, much of a difference in, in many ways from say Portland or uh, Brooklyn. They have incredible price fix menus and rest, you know, uh, restaurants where you can get a seven course seated meal to food carts everywhere. It's, it's, it's cosmopolitan, it's global. Um, and it's been, you can tell the influence goes, as I like to say from uh, ancient history through Instagram. Uh, this is a very typical meal in Northern Thailand, which caught me off guard. I've eaten Thai food a lot, but I'd never eaten Northern Thai food. It's very picky, handy, choosy. You eat uh, over the table, take small amounts, and each time you take a bite of this herb, you take a mouthful of basil, you eat an entire bunch of, of cilantro between bites. Like the amount of herbs that they eat uh, and the amount of uh, pungent ar aromatic spices that they eat here is really incredible. Um, and foods are, are, uh, are flavored in such a way. So. You may have heard of Tom Yum soup, for example. I, I actually think that Yum may have come from uh, the Thais, uh, the, the military visiting Thais, because the word Yum in Thailand means a melange of all of the flavors. So it's like sour, sweet, salty. Uh, that, is, that is the word Yum in Thailand. Uh, so I, I suspect that it, it started somewhere around the 1950s. I'm guessing that Thailand is, uh, is, is maybe the origin of that word. So in Thai language, they don't separate eating from eating rice. So if someone says, uh, that means, have you eaten yet? Uh, but it also means, have you had rice? Uh, same thing with water. You say, Gin nam. Gin nam is to drink. So if you say, uh, if you would ask someone for a drink, you would say, would you like to go drink water with me? Yes, let's go get whiskey or let's go have a beer. Um, food and cuisine is ahan. So Thai food would be ahan Thai. Uh, and then Lana food is ahan wang. And then everything is quite literal. So a shop is Ron and a restaurant is Ron Ahan, right? Uh, you know, it's a food shop. And then lunch uh, is food midday, Ahan Glang Wan. Uh, very delicious or delicious, Aloy, Aloy Mak Mak, Aloy Mak. Uh, or in Northern Thailand, Lam Diet Diet is how you say delicious in the local Lana, Lana uh, language as well. Um, being a really old area it has a huge influence in foraging. We went up to uh, into a place north of Changdao, which is pretty far, a very small village. And the grandmas there were tossing out nets and catching these fish they can only catch in this thing, had a fire, had their rice, their rice liquor, and were basically there all day fishing these fish, foraging plants, cooking them on the stove and just sharing with everybody and eating. It's like a, a foraging culture. Um, and as such, mushrooms have played a huge part in that and still do. Um, so in Thailand, mushrooms are called head. Uh, you might see that spelled with a T or a D, but head. Uh, and as in Thai, they, they speak generally first and then get more specific. So an earth star truffle uh, is head tob. They use a lot of onomatopoeia. Tob is the sound of the mushroom popping in your mouth. Um, head tob. Shiitakes are head home. Home means good smelling. That's really useful in the markets when you walk past a cart. You're like, home, home mak mak. And people smile at you because you're like, oh, that smells so good. Uh, oyster mushrooms are head nang fa or angel wing or fairy wing mushrooms. Um, I like mushrooms a lot. Chan chop head mak ka. Uh, in Thailand, you add ka if you're a female or kap if you're a male on the end of everything. It's just sort of, you just learn to sort of end that. It's maybe it's like the Canadian A. Um, so uh, I want to eat mushrooms. Chan yak gin head kap. 
And I had to add this recently, <laughs> being in the mushroom world and always being asked by everybody every single time, can I eat this? Changin ani daimakap. And with that, let's let's take a look at what we have found. So tracking the edible fungi in northern Thailand has been really great. You know, we came here when we first got to Chiang Mai. We actually were asked to quarantine for 14 days. This is back in May of last year. Um, so we're coming on on the beginning. I didn't realize that it was actually that was the beginning of mushroom season. May is when the smoke clears and the smoke clears because of the rains. And when the rains come, it is on for like four or five months. And we're talking monsoon rains, uh, swimming pools. I came down for one presentation. We had eight inches of rain in the house. I saw my shoe float by. <laughs> I was like, uh, OK, <laughs> so that's what's happening. Um, so the picture in the back of this slide is called the Mushroom Research Center. This was founded by Dr. Kevin Hyde and Dr. Dennis DeHardin. Um, Dr. Dennis DeHardin is out of uh, Pasadena. I'm uh, sorry, not Pasadena, out of uh, Palo Alto over there by, uh, by Stanford. And um, it is it has served i'm not sure it's open at the moment i think closed due to covid but it has served as a research center for students that want to come from uh, two days to three months it has full facilities uh, microscopy lab um, uh, i think it's got its own herbarium um, and so it's it's situated in the mountains between chiang mai and pai and uh, is it's just idyllic incredible space i think around three thousand feet or so um, so looking forward to connecting with them so so far, my reaching out has been uh, difficult or I haven't really received anything. Um, Thailand National Parks and Conservation uh, has produced a poster, which I will share with you all via email uh, after this, about the edible mushrooms in Thailand. It's um, all of the, according to Dr. DeHardin, all if not, most if not all of the Latin names are incorrect um, because they've been named after North American and European varieties. Uh, and the, other than a, a really cool kind of pretty poster, it doesn't give you much uh, as far as seasonability, what they grow with, where they grow, uh, or how they're used. Um, so that's been interesting to use as to track that down. Then there's a lot of scholarly articles, and they're almost all in English, uh, mostly from the universities here about the different bullets and you know how my colleges are, they get very specific. So I'm trying to track down the edible, the stuff on the edible mushrooms mostly, that's my interest, what I call mycophagy, the eating of mushrooms. Uh, and then I was introduced also through Dr. DeHardin to Dr. Sizemore at Chiang Mai University. And she is, uh, she runs a microbial research lab, which has actually been instrumental in doing the DNA analysis of a lot of the mushrooms to determine uh, their, their actual heritage, whether or not they are truly, uh, you know, from North America, which hint, they're not. Um, and uh, discovering some really awesome new, new mushrooms as well. Um, and then, just recently, I, I finally I posted out, hey, it's mushroom season's coming. If anyone's interested, I'd really like to go out onto some private land and go hunting. And I got a litany of chefs, farmers, and folks, now that I speak a little Thai, that are like, yes, call me. Let's do this. I'm ready. Um, so I'm looking really forward to going back up to Chiang Mai for this season uh, because I think it's going to greatly expand uh, what I've already been able to see on my own. So that's really exciting. Um, this is Dr. Yai. He actually uh, fairly recently finished his PhD um, on uh, actually cultivating this black bully that grows wild here. It, it's a, it's, and it was uh, assumed uh, as, a, as a mycorrhizal fungi to not be able to be um, cultivated, but they kept finding that it would kill the host plant and keep growing. And doing some research, the, it caused like a cavitation in the roots that allowed a bacteria to come in that would end up killing the host plant. But as a result of that, the mushroom learned to switch to saprobic. Um, and so he is successfully cultivating uh, a mushroom that gets as big as, as any of the porcinis I've seen. I mean, this thing, these are huge mushrooms. Um, they remind me a little more of butter bullets uh, with the, they have yellow flesh and they have more of a sweeter, uh, like the butyric acid flavor uh, than, than the sort of pungency of a bull, of a porcini, um, but really exciting nonetheless. Uh, this lab also was the one that did the DNA sequencing for a, uh, an, an endogenous Thai truffle. This is a white truffle. It's being compared to, if not the Oregon white truffle, um, some others around. It is, uh, it's, it's only been in 2018, or sorry, 2015 that this was, this was discovered um, and, and confirmed. So this is, I'd like to see if the Hope cuisine here in Thailand starts to take a twist uh, to using more truffle specifically because truffle is now a Thai ingredient. Um, 
so really interesting. This is actually the cover of a booklet that was produced. They had a huge celebration, um, very excited. Uh, Thailand has its own white truffle now. That's really cool. This is Dr. Sizemore at the top, uh, and Dr. Yai on the bottom under her, who you just saw in the previous picture, uh, and then Dr. Pat, who actually did the sequencing uh, and wrote the paper on that. Uh, so this is the mushroom poster that I was telling you about here. Um, as you can see, translating Thai can be somewhat difficult, but Google the Google Translate app does a pretty good job. This does say edible mushrooms. Um, the first three letters up there do in fact say head. Um, and yeah, there's quite a few. There's a lot of mushrooms that I'm unfamiliar with. You know, I, I, I'm familiar that I know that you can eat rusulas so far. I haven't been impressed, um, but a lot of rusulas, lactarius, some really interesting other mushrooms. The termitomyces mushroom is, is so far has been my, the one that's interested me the most. Um, and this is obviously half the poster. I will send this by, by via email to all of you. Um, so you can, you can look at this at your own time after this talk. So being me and being and needing to have all this in one place, I've, I've done exactly that. So I, I've taken all of the mushrooms from the poster, from the research papers, from my own hiking experience, um, and been adding these mushrooms together. I've now got 101 edible mushrooms uh, from around Thailand. And so that gives me a really good starting point to uh, get out there, get more photos, talk to locals, start gathering recipes, start looking at how, uh, how that's being, uh, how they're being treated. So I'm putting, I put together a, a list here. I think right now it might be the, the most, at least published uh, list of edible mushrooms in Thailand. Um, I run a members page on Patreon where I publish all of this information. And as I'm creating things like this, uh, my members have access to, uh, to, these, to these research things. So I just um, definitely putting this together to hopefully write the Edible Mushrooms of Thailand cookbook with uh, some of my local chef friends here. So that's where we're trending to here. It's pretty exciting. It's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot of mushrooms that I have not seen before too. So um, of course, mushrooms are cultivated. Asian culture is, is known for all kinds of mushrooms. They eat it all the time. They add it to all their dishes. Uh, and so here in Thailand, what you'll see head home, as I said, the good smelling mushroom, shiitakes. Uh, enoki mushrooms, head kem tong, uh, the head nang pha, oyster mushrooms seem to be the most commonly eaten mushroom. Uh, down here in the south, when we were here last year, I saw split gill mushroom in the cultivated in the store for sale. Um, I, I haven't seen it since uh, in any place in the north, um, but that was an interesting find. Of course, the straw patty mushroom, the head fong, um, the one with a little egg, uh, the jelly ear mushroom, or head hunu. Um, and the king oyster head or <laughs> uh, they take a lot of words from english it's cute or uh, other languages um and then cordyceps head tang chow i actually saw edible cordyceps at their version of costco here called macro um for really cheap it looked like a bunch of carrot shavings and a, a fresh cordyceps mushrooms as an edible um so that was pretty cool uh, this is my local mushroom lady. Um, she has the mushrooms, uh, the wild ones when they're in season and all the time has the cultivated mushrooms. So you can see many of uh, the mushrooms that uh, I just listed there. Now, if you look above the word market in that picture in the back, you'll see something that looks uh, conspicuously like truffles. Those are in fact head tall. Uh, the, the, how's it? Agri I'll get to it in a second. It's a uh, earth star truffle. It's, a, it thought, it's thought to be a geostrum, but it's, it's actually an astria. Um, and it is eaten in its closed state before it pops. And it is quite controversial and it's actually quite delicious. Uh, and that is the head top. So when you go to the market and you find the forage mushrooms, the big first one that comes up is head top, Australis hygrometricus. Uh, this is a controversial mushroom and is, <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, see, I, I like to get ahead of myself. We'll get to that in a second. Um, what I found interesting about the mushrooms that I saw forage there was I didn't have any English common names for them. Um, they were they were widely available here. They had the Thai names, but they weren't uh, they weren't related to any mushrooms that I'd really seen uh, in the U.S. So headlorm is uh, Lentinus polychroeus. It's a really tough, uh, albeit delicious mushroom. Head con cow is. Uh, it's a large mushroom. It looks like an oyster mushroom, except the stipe comes up the middle. It grows off of logs. Uh, head har is actually that uh, mushroom that uh, Dr. Yai is cultivating, Phlebopus portentosis. Uh, the head cone um, refers to, well, it referred to this mushroom when I bought it, but I think it actually refers to a lot of the different tomatomyces mushrooms. They kind of group them all in one. Uh, and they do actually have their own Caesar amanita here, head kai han. 
um, and it, it has been sequenced. That's an Amanita hemibatha. And then Hedkameen is these tiny little chanterelles that uh, currently are Cantharellus minor, but that seems to be a Pacific Northwest mushroom. So, or not, a, sorry, a, a, a North American mushroom. So we'll see uh, how, the, how the name changes on that. So these mushrooms are very controversial. They actually grow sort of in between the duff, right at the top of the dirt. And in Thailand, they have deciduous trees here. So it leaves drop. And in order to find these mushrooms more effectively, you can burn the forest. I can, you, they set fires. It used to be controlled burning, but ever since the national parks has adopted the zero burn tolerance, the hill tribes that were doing controlled burning for thousands of years have been prevented and can get arrested and go to jail for burning. And so they often will set fires and run away and just let the fire burn out of control. And they get blamed for smoky season. If you do even just a little bit of research, they aren't even 20% of the smoke in the area, or burning in Myanmar, burning in Cambodia, burning in Laos, like uncontrolled. Um, but it is interesting that the voiceless uh, hill tribes, sort of the, the minority populations are the ones that get blamed for this like really bad pollution problem. And it's these mushrooms in particular that get blamed. And it's sort of the idea, oh, they're so greedy, they're so greedy. It's like these mushrooms fetch, fetch like 10 times more per kilo than other mushrooms. But when I say that, I mean, they get like $7 a kilo, you know, it's like, <laughs> there's, there's, I don't think anyone's making millions on these. I'm sure people will tell me that I'm wrong on that. Uh, this is the head har. It normally would come up in June and July. Uh, it grows at around 1,800 to 2,000 feet with bamboo around water. Um, and as I said, it has yellow flesh and it's the, the black bullet, if you will. Uh, and it, it really, to me, it reminds me more of a butter bullet. It's super delicious, just like a bullet browns up really nicely. Um, and looking forward to having a lot more of this in my life. Uh, this is the head loam or head lorem. Um, it's the, it's a lentinous polycroyus. Now everything from where the, the decurrent gills attach up is really delicious, tender, and awesome. That stipe is probably the toughest thing I've ever put in my soup ever. I don't think even my knife could cut this type. It is like one of the most fibrous things. Uh, great for flavor and luckily in Thailand they just throw all the inedible ingredients in the soup anyway so it worked great. Um, these taste a lot like uh, Prince Agaricus on steroids. They are one of the most flavorful, delicious, incredible mushrooms uh, that I have used and it's been really fun to, to play with those and get to know them. Uh, and then there's these guys, the head kameen. I love chanterelles. I'm from Oregon. I can't, I can't help it. It's in my blood. Uh, so I actually, before I knew there were chanterelles in Thailand, I'd heard rumors of them. I smelled them in the forest on a hike, then found them. Uh, these are the most aromatic chanterelles I've ever come across. They're so beautiful. They are like apricot mossy, fresh, incredible, uh, incredible aromatic and flavorful mushrooms. Um, they're also about the size of a golf tee. Uh, so that's a banana leaf uh, behind them. They're tiny. They are a pain in the butt to, to collect. They are filthy because they're so close to the ground and it rains. Um, and gosh, they're delicious and worth every bit of effort that goes into them. Um, this is the head cone, the termitomyces. I actually bought these off a woman and the grandmas that I was, this is up in the Northern Changdao region where the grandmas were running and everything. They just swooped them out of my hand and cooked them before I got a photo of them uh, not cooked. Uh, but really simple, like fish sauce, green onions and shallots, you know, really simple, simple preparations uh, for a lot of these dishes. Um, then there's the edible mushrooms that I've found, at least I hope they're edible, um, and out in the woods. Some of them are being sold, some of them, some of them not though. Um, so these are mushrooms that I, I knew were edible or, or, uh, or had found myself out there. Um, my fiance somehow is connected to hedgehog mushrooms. It doesn't matter where we go, she finds hedgehogs. Hedgehogs and her have this like special thing. So of course we found some, I'm oh, sorry. Um, and uh, that was a surprise. And it took us a while to figure out. They're, they're almost certainly not hiding them umbilicatum. Um, anyone with the asterisk there is uh, almost certainly not that name. Um, but um, they were hedgehog mushrooms for sure. They, were, they, they looked like them. They felt like them. They, they tasted like them. And I did later learn that they, they call them head foam, which is tooth mushroom. Uh, go figure. We did find uh, the Amanita hemibatha head kaihan. What a beautiful mushroom. Uh, and also the head kai cow. Um, in this case, kai means egg, um, and the head kai cow means the white egg. These are amanitas. Uh, I found a beefsteak mushroom, that was surprising. I actually saw the uh, chinka pin um, little seed pods first, and I was like, ha oh, ha, wouldn't that be funny? Because I seem to find these a lot. And sure enough, 
found one of those. That was really cool. Uh, I haven't found any record of anybody using that anywhere in Thailand. Uh, we did find reishi mushrooms uh, growing on the monk's trail up to this old forest temple. There was a waterfall coming, coming out of the temple and there were a whole patch of wild reishis uh, growing near there. That was really neat. Um, lots of split gill mushrooms all over the place. They seem to be uh, pretty common. Of course, the head kameen, uh, kameen means turmeric, by the way. So head kameen's turmeric mushroom. Um, this is, that's the chanterelle. I did find a giant puffball, and so far the only puffball on record here, you can actually see it in the picture behind the words here. Uh, it's huge. Um, the only reference I found is what they call a uh, calvatia cranioformis. It looks like a, a brain. This one did not. It was totally smooth and gigantic. Um, Dr. Dr. Deherdine does not think it's a gigantia, um, but it was super delicious also. Um, and then I just wanted to throw in there uh, this unknown bully, and then I have a new one that I added just for you guys. So this is looking down on Chiang Mai, slightly more uh, zoomed in. As you can see, there's a square uh, right in the middle. See the red dot is actually on Wat Chedi. It's a really, really old temple from the, from the 1300s um, that's actually ordained to be the tallest thing in the city. So the city itself, the old city, which is surrounded by a moat and an ancient wall, which is that square, uh, is, is all like three-story buildings um, and really, really quite an awesome little zone. The rest of Chiang Mai sort of branches off, has circular roads and, and rim road and uh, spoke roads that go out. You can see the airport is quite close. That's about two, two kilometers uh, square, that square there. And if you look down at the Haya subdistrict under the city, I live just about where the A uh, ends uh, on, that, on that word there. As you can see, it's right next to the mountains. So Doi Siptep, uh, and Doi Pui, which uh, I'm about to show you, are the next the mountains right next to it. Doi Satep is about 5,000 feet. Doi Pui, I think, is uh, 5,200 feet. Um, and the city itself is just, you know, half an hour drive, and you are up inside the mountains. It's really, really quite cool. Um, so you'll see coming around on the lower right-hand side a small village. Thailand is broken off in what they call mubans and villages. And this is actually a hill tribe village. It's a Hmong village. Uh, the Hmong are known for their embroidery patterns and their incredibly uh, awesome, awesome uh, costumes that are just so, so colorful. Uh, my fiance has made a point of working with Hill Tribes through a nonprofit fair trade to help them sell their stuff uh, in this time because the pandemic, you know, hit everybody pretty hard as there's no tourists in Thailand. I think Thailand, Thailand went from about 3.5 million tourists uh, uh, month to zero um, for the last 14 months. So yeah, it's been, it's, been really, it's been really interesting here to see how everything affects everything. Oh, it's the videos, okay. All right, so this is my own shot, uh, similar area, Doi Pui National Park. We're probably at about 4,500 feet here or so. And as you can see, it's a, it's a mixed forest, lots of deciduous, but also pine trees, eucalyptus trees, uh, acacias, um, the teak wood, um, really, really just gorgeous mixed woods, really some old trees. They've, Thailand has done a fantastic job of preserving their national parks, maybe too good of a job, as I was saying earlier, given the pressures on some of the local peoples. Um, but this is uh, Amanita hemibatha. This is a just really gorgeous mushroom. And actually, like a lot of Amanitas, for me, the edible, the, the, cesare the cesarea clad, um, I find it to be rather fishy tasting, uh, not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, and, and as they get older, a little metallic, but that actually works really well with Thai food. They use fish or shrimp in just about everything. Um, and this mushroom made an incredible nom prick head, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, really, really tasty mushroom. And they sell these a lot at the roadside stands as well. These are fairly, fairly common. Um, these are the hedgehog mushrooms, which as I said, are probably not hydnum umbilicatum, uh, but sure tasted like them and were delicious. Um, and uh, let's see, beefsteak mushroom. I left her alone. Um, she, she was just there and looking rather old, but that was cool to find, really low to the ground. Um, so I hadn't, seen, the reason I'm, I'm highlighting these, I haven't seen them in the literature anywhere or mentioned uh, in anything that I've seen in Thailand. So it was neat to see mushrooms that I knew were edible that had not yet, had not yet come across. And here are the uh, golf teas, the, the head kameen. Uh, this was a pretty funny day. Well, funny now. Um, we ended up, we went on a 12 kilometer hike, probably didn't bring enough water for a 12 kilometer hike, ended up on an 18.7 kilometer hike by accident somehow. Um, 
did not have enough water for that for sure. And uh, at some point, like maybe almost two thirds of the way through, everyone's exhausted and these things happen. I smell them. I'm like, what the chanterelles? I smell them. <laughs> Where are these? Start picking them and just swarmed by mosquitoes. Everybody left. I managed to get just a few before it was just overwhelming. Um, but yeah, kind of a pain in the butt mushroom to grab, but wow, they're so delicious. Uh, here's a, the reishi that we found. We grabbed a couple uh, and here in uh, Thailand, head, head lin chua, um, Ganoderma lacidium, of course, the, the OG, the OG medicinal mushroom. Um, this is one of the giant puffballs we found. We ended up finding an entire uh, family of these going up a creek. That's actually one of the smaller ones that we found. Uh, the big one that we got was uh, as big or bigger than my head, um, making that face because this one was kind of rotten and it's actually how we found them was the smell. Um, split gill mushrooms, just so cute. This one had such more of a purple outline with the eye, but you know, the camera hardly captures the right things. Uh, and then this really peculiar mushroom, which I found uh, at the very end of the hike and just couldn't be bothered. And I wasn't sure if that was a mold on the outside of it, or if this is actually what the mushroom looks like, or if the spores are supposed to be green like that, or what was going on. So I left that one behind. Um, but definitely interested in uh, spending a lot more time in the woods coming up. Um, the Amanita princeps, I, I took this picture at, uh, at one of the roadside stands. So Amanita princeps is eaten widely. This is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the white egged Amanita. I discovered this mushroom because I was with some friends and I was like, look guys, a death cap. Look at this. We're going to, I was like, see, it's going to, Oh, it is marginated. And I was like, you know, it, 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 it'll be pithy in the middle. And it wasn't. And then I was like, but look at this. It'll have a bulb. No, it's got a straight stem. And I was like, what is this mushroom? That, like, it looks just like a death cap. Uh, it turns out it's these, the Amanita princeps. They're eaten. They're widely eaten here. Apparently, there are also death caps here. Uh, I could not bring myself ever to try these. Um, I just, maybe this year, we'll see. Uh, and what I found out is there's actually quite a large Hmong population in the Sacramento area in, in uh, California. M most of them are Vietnamese Hmong that were displaced during the Vietnam War uh, and have, have grown up in California at this point. Um, but a lot of the mushroom poisonings that happen in California are people confusing the death cap for uh, mushrooms that look similar to it from Asia, uh, which is really sad. Um, but man, it really, really looks like it. And then I had to, I actually added this one this morning. Um, and as you can see there at the bottom disclaimer, this is not found in the Lana Kingdom, but it is raining down here. It is raining up north. It is in fact mushroom season in the south of Thailand as well. And uh, these guys are coming up gangbusters and they're selling them at all the roadside stands. Um, they're really fun to find, pretty small, little cute little things. You just, they just cook them whole. Uh, and they're, they hold their, they turn gray when you cook them and their white pores stay white and they're just really cute, uh, kind of like small uh, shiitakes. Um, I've boiled them. I have, uh, I've done everything I can. These are disgusting. I cannot recommend them at all, except that the bitter that is just really bad, <laughs> like comment out loud bad when you try them bad. Um, the bitter is actually a uh, bitter alkaloid that's been, I that found some great papers on this, uh, that is incredibly antioxidant and antibacterial, um, and, uh, potentially, you know, potentially antiviral as well, or immune strengthening in such a way. They, there's brand new research, uh, on a herb here in Thailand called Tafel Chon, um, that is actually be showing really good promise in curing people who have COVID. Um, they really do get into their bitters. And so I have to chalk this one up into eating your medicine um, because I've not found a way to make this even remotely palatable. Um, but it's, it's definitely everywhere right now. So good on them. It's came up at a perfect time for the new COVID wave. So we'll see uh, how that goes. So talking about cooking, uh, Thailand um, really has in some ways stone age cooking uh, uh, utensils. You know, they have... Uh, Stone, the, uh, the stone mortar and pestle, the croque la sac, uh, and boiling is really, really common. You know, you mash something, you throw it in the water, you boil it, you make a soup, you eat it. And that's, and that's what, what's fascinating to me is that some of the recipes that are being eaten could have been perfected 30,000 years ago or, or more. You know, these are, these are, uh, these are really incredible, um, medicinal, powerful, like all of the herbs they're eating, all of the, all of the aromatics, the mushrooms that are putting in there, like the, the medicine that the Thais are eating and the way that they prepare them 
um, is, is so clean. And so it's not actually a surprise to me that Thailand has relatively um, escaped the COVID thing. You know, as I said, this is our third wave. Uh, and by that, I mean, I think we just passed 100 deaths in the country. Um, and we went, I think we had 1300 cases uh, yesterday, which is, um, you know, we have 43,000 total cases, I think, in this country. It's been, and the response is amazing when people say stay at home, when the government says stay at home, people stay at home. Um, people care about each other. It's been really, really phenomenal. Uh, and it's given me a lot of free time to write, actually, because you can't really go out and do stuff. But anyway, um, they love to grill here. They love grilling things, although they don't eat the charcoal bits. They usually grill it in a banana leaf and toss that out, whereas in Mexico, they just grill everything black and, and, and mix it all together. But grilling here is a bing. If you see a P by itself, it's more of a PB sound. So blah bing is grilled fish, uh, blah being fish. Boiling is uh, tom, which you probably are familiar if you've ever eaten Thai, tom ka, tom ka gai, uh, which means boiled galangal chicken in this case, gai is chicken. Uh, pad Thai in this case actually means just Thai stir fry. Pad means is the act of stir frying. Um, and Pad Thai was not even a Thai dish. It was actually created in a competition to make a dish that represented Thailand to be exported. So go figure, uh, it was sort of a created iconic dish. Uh, frying things is Todd. So uh, fried pork or pork rinds can be mu tot or mu grob. Grob means crispy. Uh, to saute things is kua. So lap kua or pak kua, sauteed greens. Sauteed uh, lap is a, is, or larb, as, as some people know it, is a, is a diced meat. Up in the north, they actually use spices and different ingredients than they do in the south, which is uh, Laotian. Um, there's a lot more spices, a lot more uh, Silk Road influence up there. To, to mash something is actually tam, but, or tam, um, but tam also means to do. So uh, tam, tamahan is to cook, to do cooking, um, or tamangan is do work, is to be working. Um, and in this case, mashing is built in. So sam tam, uh, sam tam is the uh, green, green papaya salad, um, but tam is actually the mashing and sam means sour. So uh, home, smell good, home, bitter, home, sour. Um, and then dried is hang, and head hang would be dried mushrooms. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to eat mushrooms here. I mean, I don't know that they have like mushroom. There's only a few mushroom specific dishes that I've found that are like made to highlight the mushrooms. Um, in the north, they do a lot of curries and soups, which are basically the same thing. And in, in northern Thailand, there's very little coconut milk. Um, khao soy, which is sort of the iconic noodle soup out of Chiang Mai does have coconut milk, although I did find the original khao soy from Yunnan, uh, and it does not have coconut milk. Um, and so a lot of the gang curries are called gang, gang are, are soups. Um, and so uh, they basically are making a paste, mixing it with water or broth, bone broth, and making all kinds of different soups. And mushrooms are often a part of what's thrown in there. Um, there's a lot of chili paste. That photo I showed you earlier when it was a spread uh, what they make is, is chili pastes, and by that it's garlic, shallots, chilies, and then whatever the ingredient sort of is named after. Of course, there's some variations on that, but nam prick, which means uh, chili water or water chili, uh, is, is everywhere, and you can order all kinds of different nam pricks. And if you've ever made a Thai curry from scratch, when you've got a Thai curry paste, that's called a nam prick gang, which means... Uh, nam, uh, a chili paste specifically for curries. In the north, they, they eat a lot of what's called nam prick chim. Uh, and nam prick chim, chim means to taste. And so you don't actually use them in a dish. You just eat them, you spread them on sticky rice, you put them on your vegetables, and you sort of are eating uh, like these really spicy, intense little bites, uh, really flavorful. And one of the things they make with those is nam prick head. Uh, a nam prick head is, uh, is chilies, uh, garlic, mushrooms and, and uh, shallots, and that's it. Uh, some fish sauce or some shrimp paste, uh, and that's about it. And you can use it with all different kinds of mushrooms. It's a really awesome way to taste the mushrooms within the Thai context. Uh, strangely, they eat steamed mushrooms here, which I have not found a palate for yet. Steamed oyster mushrooms are probably the limpest, soggiest, weirdest um, thing. That, <laughs> But they do eat it with another nam prick, nam prick ka, uh, which is from Tom Ka, uh, Ka means galangal. And if you don't know what that is, it's the naked mole rat of ginger. It's sort of a, a it's tougher and has a bit more of, much more of a pungent flavor. Um, so they make nam prick Ka to be eaten specifically with mushrooms. And right now in, in head top season, that actually is a, is a, is a delicacy is nam prick Ka with steamed head top, the little popping mushrooms. 
um, sometimes just sauteed like the ones I showed you uh, from the Zermites mushrooms. And then uh, fermented, which is really cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a fermented pork uh, called nam uh, or, gang, or uh, jin salm, which means sour, sour meat. Nam is made by using pork, cooked pig skin, raw pig, uh, raw ground pork, garlic, and sticky rice. And you wrap it really tightly and set it out on your counter. Um, and uh, they also make nam head, nam head, which is just mushrooms that have been cooked and then wrapped in the same way and allowed to lacto ferment. And it is so good. It's really good with eggs. Um, then of course, deep fried mushrooms, battered and fried everything here. I mean, we are in. A uh, very tourist heavy thing. And if there's anything that's easy to eat, it's battered and fried everything. So in this case, head todd, uh, deep fried mushrooms. And then I've seen them uh, skewered. They eat a lot of the, the king oyster mushrooms. Um, so head bing, you know, um, grilled and, uh, and put onto the barbecue. Uh, so that's been really quite delicious as well. This is actually uh, the garden at my house in Chiang Mai. It is a uh, throw the seeds everywhere. I cannot wait to see it when we get back. When we left, it was full of tomato plants and squash plants, but none of them had fruited yet. So we'll see what happens when we get back. Almost everything you can see, grass aside, is edible. Uh, in the front is galangal, ginger, turmeric, um, and, and some of the other related uh, root veggies. They have a cinnamon tree, there's a licorice. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I host actually, and behind it is a cooking school. My, my fiance also has a knack for finding the most incredible Airbnbs. Um, so of course, when we had to come up in quarantine, she found this amazing three bedroom house on this property that's right inside the city, but somehow not, that has a cooking school and I was hooked right away. Um, so I wanna share a little bit of the recipes with you guys. And I don't worry, uh, if you don't, don't write this down, I'm gonna send you the, the actual recipes themselves afterward. I have quite a package to send all of you as a follow-up. Um, but this is essentially non-prick head. What I learned in Northern Thailand is they don't have recipes. They, they know this by muscle memory, which is really what also leads me to believe they've been doing this for hundreds if not thousands of years. Uh, and so what I had to tell my instructors, my, my friends and folks that are teaching me, I was like, can I just lay out, just you pick out the ingredients as you would use them. And let me lay them out on the cutting board and I'll take a picture of it. Um, and then I realized that's actually great for me because that's how I cook also, I don't use recipes. Um, and so uh, I've been doing this with a lot of the recipes as I, as I learn things. But this is non prick head. This is actually gonna be turned into two versions. As you can see the head top at the top and the head heart at the bottom there. Uh, that's the, the yellow kind of buttery bully, the black, the black bully there. Um, the bigger chilies there are, are called prick noom. They're, they're the mild version. They're, they're sort of the Anaheim, I'd say, uh, version of chilies in Thailand. And of course the, the prick kinu or the mouse turd chilies are the really, really spicy ones. Um, that is Thai garlic. In, Thai, in, in Thailand, the garlic is so tiny. And when I first saw it, I was like, this is insane. You have to peel all of this. And they're like, no, I'll peel it. Just throw it in there and mash it with the peel, which they do. And it's fine. Um, I wouldn't try that with our garlic. The peels tend to be a bit tougher, um, but the papery, the papery peelings on this Thai garlic is, is totally fine. Um, so this is nam head. So this is after it's been fermented. You can see it's been folded up in banana leaf with some sticky rice and several different kinds of mushrooms that have been shredded. Uh, totally delicious. It's sour and after, after you ferment it, it'll keep for a month in your fridge. Um, really, really cool. I'll send you guys a recipe on that one as well. Um, now, I know what you may be thinking, because this is what happened to me. This spread of ingredients and of foods that isn't Thai food somehow hasn't made it out of, out of, uh, out of Thailand to America yet is maybe, my God, I've never eaten Thai food. That's pretty much how I felt. In fact, I exclaimed that out loud and on my Instagram the first time I went to a northern Thai restaurant. And I was like, what is all of this? Um, so I have been writing a cookbook now for the last year, and I actually am really happy to announce that. Uh, and you guys are the first group that's heard this. I just uh, agreed and signed a contract to pay for professional editing um, from, a, from a cookbook editor that I was introduced to. And uh, so this in June will be edited, and I've got a ton of pictures. Um, I think it's like 120 recipes and uh, almost almost 170 pages. So it's really exciting. I can't, this is my first actual cookbook that I've written um, and it goes into all kinds of detail uh, about the cuisine. Um, touching a little bit of mushrooms, but not too much. Um, so things like this, you know, where, where, where I get to play, where I break out of the box and I get to mess around a little bit. I wanted to use those chanterelles that I got under fire for mosquitoes and after being exhausted from this walk. Um, and I wanted to use Northern Thai spices. So I wanted to make something like a Penang, uh, but use Northern Thai spices rather than 
uh, the star anise. And as you can see in that bowl down there, uh, Balinese long pepper, highly recommend Balinese long pepper. You should get it right away. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it was actually recommended to me several years ago by Alan Rockefeller uh, as one of the only other things he knew of that smelled like Matsutake. Um, and I've fallen in love. I don't think it smells like Matsutake, but it does have an aroma um, that is undeniably one of the best things on the planet. Turns out that the um, Sanskrit name for that, this is the long, the long pine cone looking thing in that green bowl there. The Sanskrit name for that is Pipili. Uh, and the English word pepper uh, and pimento uh, in, in Latin is actually derived from papili. And here in Thailand, the name of it is dipli, which is also derived from papili. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, I, I also love or etymology and how words, uh, uh, how words change over time. So that one to me is one of the most direct crossovers of Thailand and English uh, coming from the root. And of course it's with food, right? Uh, besides that, there's something called makwan. Makwan is a prickly pear or prickly ash seed that's very similar to um, Zeshwan peppercorn. Uh, so it's a numbing, a numbing flavor. Of course, uh, coriander, um, and then this black, black cardamom. Uh, I mash all this together, right? Because in order to create uh, a chili paste. So this is, as I said, a non prick gang. This is meant to be uh, turned into a uh, into a, a curry, and I, I just I do love coconut in my curry, so I, I did that. Um, but uh, wow, the chanterelles are inside that paste, and now they're in every single part of the soup. It is incredible. Um, they really, really uh, are effusive. For that small amount of chanterelles that I got, I was able to make a, a really fantastic dish uh, out of that. So that was quite exciting. Um, let's see. Speaking of chanterelles, I'd like to introduce you guys to something else that I'm into. Um, so uh, I've actually been lecturing at Soma, the Sonoma uh, mushroom camp for the last several years. I think I've been six out of the last eight years or so. Uh, and, and what I honed in on was basically translating the science of cooking and eating mushrooms into layperson's terms. So uh, that is actually the big project I'm working on. Um, is to is to help chefs understand why a chanterelle tastes like a chanterelle. Why does a porcini taste like a porcini? And so you find really interesting things like this: the volatile composition and sensory profile uh, as affected by drying method. Okay, so you know why does this matter? <laughs> Who cares about this stuff, right? Um, well, as you're probably aware of in LA, the the uh, molecular gastronomy scene and where food is going in terms of um, gels and you know the the famous foams and all that. Um, a lot of that, what that is, is really getting down to the nitty gritty of how do you isolate and break out certain chemicals and, and use certain things, and how do you use that to inform better pairings, better ideas, better concepts in the kitchen. Well, this is the most complete uh, volatile composition that I've found of chanterelles anywhere. It has 39 um, different compounds that make up the volatile aroma of chanterelles. Um, and this might seem like a lot of information, um, and it is, and maybe it's not specifically important, but where it does come into play is in flavor pairing theory. Uh, it is suggested, and probably uh, I think is, is getting closer to being proven, that two things that share similar chemical aromatic compounds uh, will go together in our mouth, like that ratatouille moment when you're like, wow, this plus this, and everything works out. And so once you start knowing what's inside the mushrooms, and this is literally just, sorry, this is, Anyway, that was uh, that was just a, a, from the table straight across. I'm sorry about this, guys. Okay, so if you just cut straight across, so the one octin three, all these are uh, the, the other food sources are potentially foods that pair with chanterelles that you may not have expected, um, and so this actually does inform chefs and inform home cooks who are interested uh, how to cook mushrooms better. Not to mention that this is showing changes uh, over different drying times, which means that preparing the mushrooms in different ways might bring out, highlight, or change the flavor at the end. So this is actually pretty darn important, I think, at least for me, it's the questions I have as a chef, like where can I go with this? Um, so what's interesting is that it's not just uh, the volatiles. There's also non-volatile taste components as well, right? The, the, uh, we have bioactive compounds. There's, there's uh, taste components such as fats, uh, sugars, um, the free aminos, 
all kinds of other uh, things that affect the flavor of chanterelles. And so what I'm what I'm proposing to do and have actually I've been doing now for for several years is decoding uh, the mushrooms in a way that we can definitively say here is a board, here is a porcini here's what it tastes like here's how you cook it to bring out this flavor here's how you cook it to bring out that flavor here's what happens when you dry it etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and so that's been a really really fun project to be working on in the background uh, and if you would like to help me with that this is in fact the patreon page that I mentioned before uh, that is called mycophagy the art and science of cooking and eating mushrooms um, it is a member page there although there are several free posts on there you can peruse the titles and see what's going on um, if you're interested and you want to help out with that, everything helps right now. I'm not allowed to work in Thailand, so uh, it's really great. I've got like 11 folks helping me right now, making 100 bucks a month. It's awesome. Um, but it's been great. It's a really fun project uh, to work on, and I, I hope that you do check that out. Uh, also, you can follow me on Instagram slash mycophagy book, Facebook slash mycophagy book, and I'll send all that information in the follow up email. Um, but if you can't be bothered with that and you're, you're done with all that, I did create a free cookbook actually during the first lockdown last year. Actually, at this time last year, I was writing this cookbook. This is free. It's on my website. You do have to give me your email and I suck at emails. So if you ever get one from me, that's a surprise. Usually once every two months or three months, I'll be like, hey, I'm coming here. Or I'm doing this. Um, so I do not I do not blast your email. But if you do give me your email, uh, you can have this book. It's about 63 recipes, I think. Not all Thai. Some of it's, it's basically just a, a log of, of what I cooked while we were locked down for seven weeks on a beach we couldn't go to. Um, there was like 10 of us and I cooked for everyone. It's pretty fun. Fun little, fun little uh, jaunt. Um, but it really did lend the way towards the next cookbook. So um, this is the inspiration. May not be free forever, so grab that. And uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Kristen and Trent Blizzard. If you haven't seen Trent's uh, morel maps, he is the premier morel map maker um, out of out of uh, Colorado. Uh, they recently just had this book for it or published, and it's uh, features twenty four foragers. I'm happy to be one of those foragers. I met these guys after the Soma at Soma camp last year or two years ago, I guess. Um, yeah, last year, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and uh, hit it off and I was honored to be in their book. So that was that was quite cool. And the very last thing I just wanted to mention, my fiance has been working uh, with the Hill Tribes here who have been really affected by COVID. You know, they sell their artisanship to the millions of tourists that come to Thailand every year. Um, and if you check out travelingtradersbazaar.com, we've actually been making face masks um, with, uh, with Hmong Hill Tribe and Karen Hill Tribe folks uh, working with a fair trade nonprofit uh, here in Chiang Mai. So please go and check that website out. It's been just so awesome to be here and to help sort of at least bring some kind of life and, uh, and to the economy here. Um, and the Thai people are resilient and uh, watch this space. You know, we're going through it right now and hopefully everything is working out. But it's been really fun. Thank you guys uh, for the presentation. Kapun ma kap. Um, I'm not sure how you all would like to do question and answer, but I am at your mercy. Wow, great. Thank you so much for an interesting culinary journey. Yeah. Um, I will give people a second to get their questions and I usually get the um, <laughs> pleasure of asking the first one while people think about what they want to ask but a couple things um one is you mentioned poisonous amanitas yeah um crossing over with your you know that edible one that you were afraid yeah. to eat i i really appreciate you mentioning that because that's the kind of thing the reverse is what we hear about over here which is people coming from Southeast Asia and uh, looking at, you know, Amanita floides and Ocreata mm -hmm. and thinking they look like an edible mushroom yeah. that they've seen before. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have um, other poisonous mushrooms you wanted to mention to the Mycological Society. Like if I were traveling there as a potential mycologist, what's what are the other ones you look out for? I mean, we talk about them so much here in the Mycological Society, everyone knows and, you know, but we, we don't know what you faced. Yeah, you know, I, 
yeah, obviously they're not selling the poisonous mushrooms at the market and um, I'm not as familiar with mushrooms you can't eat. Um, and so I, I may have stumbled, you know, we went on that, the walk in Doi Pui there was I think at the height of mushroom season, which was like August. And we took photographs of 75 different fungi without ever leaving the trail. Um, and there may very well be poisonous, not edible by any stretch of the imagination. There may be some other poisonous ones in there, but as far as I know, they do have the destroying angel or some variation of it. Uh, and, and also the Amanita phylloides, uh, the Thai government had put out some warnings in, in advance of mushroom season about knowing your mushrooms all in Thai. Uh, but other than that, I haven't, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to remember if I saw a Cortinarius or just thought it was a Cortinarius. Um, so I'm not, I'm not super, I'm not super familiar with, with all the toxic ones, but that's definitely something I'm interested in, in pursuing more. Um, but definitely Amanitas, they got a lot of Amanitas here. Okay, well, that's interesting. And I guess the, um, just my follow up would be, we really appreciate making your recipes available. And I, I saw some that looked to me inherently, possibly vegan. But I also do some Thai cooking myself because I've had Thai students in my lab that influence my cooking. And um, I know that a lot of the sauces they have have um, uh, fish sauce in them and shrimp extracts. And so I'd just like to ask when you, when you send your recipes down, could you maybe flag like maybe your top three that's one is vegan? <laughs> yeah, well, and one is vegetarian and then maybe one is omnivorous. Well, I mean, I'm sending the recipes that I showed you guys. So the, um, the head, the non-prick, uh, non prick head could easily be made vegan. They, they use shrimp paste here, but you can easily make it with salt, um, no problem. Um, yeah, you know, or the, the thing I'd it. substitute is like Kalamata olive juice, you know, which is kind of yeah, an right. umami flavor, but yeah, you know, awesome. um, the, yeah, the, right. um, it's, it's just something that um, um, I see so much in what you're presenting. I really appreciate it. I, I just, want to try and make it easier for some people to maybe yeah. uh, figure yeah. out what's really in it because that's one of the common questions we get you know for example and when we used to have actual potlucks is yeah 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 the old yeah, you, got, you got to make the full list man <laughs> yeah I, uh, I cooked at a, at a retreat center in, in Oregon that you, it was already vegetarian but then you had still had to make the special diet version which was literally like no garlic no onions but you're expected to make it taste the same as, as the other one. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, you know, these are, we have, these, so. are, these are excerpts, um, excerpts from the book. So I, um, I can add uh, sort of ideas in the email about how to, how to change them. But for the yeah, most part. Yeah, that would be great. You know, you're really yeah. generous and we appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, the Nam head itself is vegan. I mean, it, it, as far as cultures are vegan. Um, uh and then, yeah, the, the, the non-prick head could easily be made, you know, shrimp paste could, like you said, olive juice or, um, actually my friend, there's one ingredient here in Northern Thailand that is, as far as I know, impossible to get anywhere else in the world. And it's these fermented soy discs and they, they'll, they'll ferment these soybeans until they turn black, then drain them, then turn them into a paste, then mash them into a paste and dry that disc. And what it tastes like to me is dehydrated, saltless soy sauce. Um, it's like, it's just, and, it, and it's thickening, it'll thicken a broth. Uh, and I did recently just find a recipe <laughs> for that. And maybe I can, um, uh, like a make at home recipe. And, and it's specifically from a vegan website as an alternative to shrimp paste. So I will see if I can't track that down. It's in one of my threads and I'll, I'll include that also in the email. That would be appreciated. Yeah, for sure. Are there some other questions where we've opened up the chat the and here. the, the the um, microphones. Um, I have a quick question. Um, where is it? Am I, can you guys hear me? Or? I can barely hear you. Can barely you hear. Stop. Huh. <laughs> Your speaker, you might, go ahead, try again. Um, let me just, can there you, you go. better? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that is better actually. Um, I've been, so I've been like looking, trying to get into, um, uh, looking into more foraging groups and, uh, wanting to do, uh, more 
learning about um, like mushrooms and plants that you can um, like that type of stuff. I was wondering if anyone has any recommendations on classes or on classes I could take like online. So is the chat open, Rich? Can you? Um, yes, the chat's open. Is your name? I see Dina something. Are you Dina? Yes. Can Dina? Can you maybe just put your, if you're willing to, put yeah. your email in the chat, and say foraging, and you might find some people. Where where, where are you located? Um, I'm located in um. Like at the moment, I'm located in Los Angeles, but I'm also like moving around. So it's one of those things. Yeah, so I mean, of course, the Mycological Society does have some field trips. Of course, with dry weather, we're really limited. Um, and I meet a lot of people, and I know Florence meets a lot of people too. Um, she can talk about maybe the uh, Native Plant Society, but you know, there are a lot of people interested in the other wild edibles that we have. Uh, Florence, do you want to say anything? Yeah, there are a couple of people. It's like, there's somebody that used to be part of Lambs. Uh, I'd need to think about his his name. And, and there's somebody else who's been uh, leading foraging uh, walks for, I would say, 30 years. So he's pretty knowledgeable. And uh, if I just get your email, uh, when, I, when I get those names, I can send those to you. And they're both local. They lead walks. Florence? Uh, what about Mohammed? He used to lead a lot of foraging trips. That I don't know. I've never been on one of his. But um, these two people I'm thinking of are, have been doing it literally for decades. As Pascal Bodar, maybe? What, who is that? Pascal Bodar, the Belgian guy. He's no, based in, no, no. Nyerges? No. What's his first Nyerges. name? Christ yeah, Christopher Nyerges. Yeah. And who's the other guy? Um, Thompson? He Robertson? Used come, he used to come to our mushroom. Meeting. Yeah, the Robertson one was the one. Robertson. Robertson. John, Ro John Robertson, I think. Jim. I Jim forgot Robertson. the first Jim name. Robertson. It might be Jim, but the, yeah. definitely yeah. Robertson. We could forward. I'll put him in the chat, too. Info. He yeah. has his aboriginal you know foraging and right. witchcraft uh, and i would really strongly suggest contacting chris nyerges because he does know something about mushrooms too okay good so um and i saw just somebody else who said uh vicky the split i think maybe she does lead forays as well who is that are you able to see the chat dina Yes. Yeah, so you. I would just copy all of that and you can sort through it. And also uh, Florence's email contact is on the web, so the LAMS website. Cool. Thank you. Oh well, yeah, it's mine. Good one. And, and others too, but um, you know, we can uh, keep it going and try and get you the information. Other questions? Actually, I do have some. Uh, chat. Is Zachary still around? I guess. So. Yeah, he's here. Okay. Hey. He <laughs> hey. Uh, yeah. First of all, thanks. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm super hungry now, awesome. and I want to come to Thailand <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, just just a couple little things I saw. So the beefsteak mushroom was that actually in a burned forest? It looked like charcoal all around. Uh, yeah. So the the fires here are also similar to some of the fires in LA, where it's like the brush burns and and the trees mm -hmm. aren't necessarily killed. Um, you know, roar through the thing and burn all the underbrush uh, and hit the bottom side of it. So that was a forest, there had been a forest fire there last year. Um, but, you know, anything above, say, 15 feet was still thriving. Um, no more else, though. What's that? No more, no more else. else, though. No, nowhere, nowhere. China was as, as the, furthest, the furthest south that I could see where they were, where they were being reported. Even though they have, uh, even though they have conifers. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we're about 18, 19 degrees latitude here. Or sorry, in Chiang Mai. I think I'm mm -hmm. much, much further south at this point. Yeah, um, I guess so. Yeah, generally up, up there. It's actually about the same as the southern point of uh, the big island of Hawaii. Um, and incidentally, yeah. 
exactly the same as where we wanted to be living right now in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> Oaxaca's great too. I'm getting yeah, hungry <laughs> for Oaxaca as well. <laughs> same, right? I mean, if Chiang Mai had a sister city, it would be Oaxaca. They are so yeah. similar uh, in how dissimilar they are from their, their country of where they're situated. You know, right. Oaxaca is its exactly. own beast within uh, Mexico and Chiang Mai is its own beast within Thailand, for sure. Uh, yeah. Korea, I've always... Oh, I think you muted yourself, Don. Uh, well, I can ask my other question. Uh, in ingredients for your chanterelle um, dish, uh, there was like a green ball in the middle. What was that? Yeah, so the green bowl is the spices that they use here. Um, oh, okay. The so one that I was talking, I kind of talked about was called Balinese long pepper. Um, and that is a phenomenal ingredient that everybody should have. Um, oh, so that's the bowl, not the bowl. Like the, the huh? like, they looked almost like, a, what do you call it? The Ozark orange or something? Um, oh, yes. It was some kind of citrus. Yeah, oh. exactly. Yeah. I have to look at like it again. A, a green round thing. Oh, it, oh it, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that was a uh, kefir lime. Oh, so, it is. Uh, okay. familiar yeah. with kefir lime leaf. Yes. Um, they use the peel also, although you don't. I don't think they ever oh. actually eat the fruit. Um, but they'll take the like the zest of the of the kefir lime. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. So yeah, I never seen the fruit. I've only seen the leaves. Always. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. The zest has um. I'd say even more limey if it could be than the leaf itself. Um, and a little more on the sweeter, the sweeter side of things. All right. And one will tell me that depending on what you want your recipe to be, they use different parts of the lemongrass stock. Uh, I see. Uh, it gets it has different nuances. <laughs> it gets like so nuanced. You know, it's sweeter down here. It's like more, more herbal up top. And yeah, nice. it's it's really amazing. Is everybody uh, growing lemongrass? Is everybody growing Every lemongrass oh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. yard? Yeah, lemongrass goes everywhere. Okay. Uh, I have still... a question about the schizophilum. Uh, sorry, Andre, are you done? Uh, well, one more thing. Are you still moving to Oaxaca or are you going to stay put in? You know, that? funny story on that. Um, we have a, an astrologer friend and we went in to see her before the pandemic hit while in Thailand. She lives here in Thailand. And, uh, you know, we had a house rented in Oaxaca in June. We were like ready to go. We, I had three mushroom tours actually in Mexico that were on the books. Uh, uh -huh. the three, a week long with Alan Rockefeller to go down and tour mushrooms in Mexico. And we meet with this astrologer and she's like, yeah, I don't know, guys. I mean, I'm just feeling 2024, 2025 for Oaxaca. And we're like, what? Wow. that's absurd. Okay. We're ready now. <laughs> and now here we are here. I'm like, yeah, it seems reasonable. Yeah, 2024 seems totally reasonable. Right. So, I mean, ultimately, yes, we'd love to go back there. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll uh, I saw your um, question on the schizophilum. What did they taste like? Was that your question? Well, yeah, thanks. well, I was wondering about the texture as well as yeah, how rubber. they taste. Yeah, a bit rubbery. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. there must be a heck of a lot of it around. And so is it is highly seasoned to give it some flavor? You know, I don't, I don't, they, they highly season everything here. So I, it, oftentimes things are, are sort of indiscriminately just thrown into soups. I'm not sure they're like, particularly isolating one flavor or another. Although actually down here on Koh Lanta, I'm finding quite a few restaurants that are specializing in things, which is so rare in tourist Thailand. It's usually they have something for everyone and it's all mediocre, but down here there's actually, uh, there's a chef that's really taking his own takes on things and, and making Thai food in a slightly different way or featuring local ingredients. But that seems to be relatively new uh, outside of places like Bangkok and Chiang Mai. Ah, oh, all right. And then my other question was, so so is there a thriving mushroom cultivation industry? And if so, what, what species do they? Um, I mean, there are ties, ties, especially Northern ties are entrepreneurial folks I've ever met. You know, as from my friend, they just closed their rock and roll bar about it they're like oh i'm so sad we had to close this restaurant come to our restaurant opening tomorrow um and that is basically how ties do if there's an opportunity to have a business they will do that so almost every farm has some form of mushrooms growing somewhere in um growing everywhere and they're eating, eating commonly. but um 
there are mushroom farms, um, but it seems like it's very like distributed. And I don't know if once you get down to Bangkok and some of the more industrial farm areas uh, that you'll see the large mushroom. There's a lot of folk, uh, folk growing up here in Northern Thailand. Um, and it's really outside of Chiang Mai, it's just villages sort of distributed and farms and, and, and land. So you do see now that I, and once I started looking for it, I was like, oh, there's a mushroom barn there. Oh, there's a mushroom tent there. Oh, there's, um, so they are they are grown all over the place. Thais Ty, never miss an opportunity to use a part of their land to make some kind of business out of it. It's pretty right. amazing. All right. Zach, Zachary, could I ask a question? Of course. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned that you have a degree in geology and I think that's interesting. I was wondering if you have any insights through that lens that speaks to what minerals are present in the soil for what it, the, the fungus that grows like that. And then also if there's any, I don't know, like extreme similarities or divergence between the relationship of the fungus to the botany in the area and like what what trees and or plants do they associate with? Like the, the tiny chanterelles, little um, golf keys and, yeah, and the amanitas. So, uh, amanitas are mostly up near the pine forests, up, up uh, the very higher elevations. Um, and it actually does, over, over 5,000 feet, it almost turns exclusively pine. Um, and that's generally where you find the amanitas. The uh, chanterelles grow with the diptocarps, which are these really magnificent, super tall, almost no branches for like 50 feet leaves that are like this big. Um, and they're, they're around 1800 to 2300 feet. Um, and it's full deciduous. Um, and where we found them was, was as a mixed forest growing with those as, as probably around 1800 feet as we came down from the mountain. Um, and then I was speaking to, uh, I, I gave a talk recently to, um, where was it, to upstate New York. And one of the guys there was, was coming in from Canada. His family is from Thailand. And he was like, you must learn your trees. If you're gonna find mushrooms, learn your trees and, and learn them in Thai so that you can ask people where they are. Um, and so I, I need to do more of that. That's why I created that spreadsheet was sort of a, a put all mushroom specific sort of as I find it, it up. Um, so definitely tree, I, you know, the purple ones that I just found were growing in what see, I mean, it's, we're basically on an island right now that's pretty full. Um, and that was the acacia, acacia magium or acacia, the purple ones grow with that. Piling it and then learning what, what the individual trees are. Because I knew to look for it because there were. Great question. Thank you. Rebecca, it's been, at least for me, breaking up a little bit. Is that true for other people? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just on my end. <laughs> well, we're getting nods that we're having you break up. We're getting close to nine o'clock. Uh, maybe take one more question. One or two. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share my email as well if people want to send me direct questions. Yeah, I Hi, think there. that would be great. I mean, we I think there's a lot of appreciation for what you presented here tonight. Absolutely. And, you know, great. Um, anyone that cooks mushrooms is a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, <awesome. laughs> you know, this good starting point. And well, it, it uh, leads to a lot of things. Unique stuff <laughs> too. Yeah, I um I presented to the Mendocino group, and that's sort of a lot of those folks I've hunted with before as part of the Sonoma crew. I lived in Santa Cruz for uh, six years actually, and mm -hmm. uh, finished presenting. And and Mary Winslow, she co-wrote the Mendocino Mushroom Cookbook, which you probably have seen. Um, it's like one of California's more recent cookbooks. She's like, you know, I have a house in Thailand that you could stay at. And I was like, what? <laughs> so you never know what you're gonna find when you start yeah, talking to mushroom yeah. folks. Um, and that's actually the first place we stayed in the South. It was wonderful. Um, and 
because of that ended up meeting some of the other folks that were now into mushrooms because their friend did mushrooms and took them on a walk and now so it's yeah it's been awesome it's it's great to have support and and on to find all the geeks like you guys <laughs> well that's great um i guess we'll wrap it up here and um did you it, are just tell us it was your name in the chat like your contact info in the chat i just uh, dropped my email in the chat and i can put my name yeah in there so that too. means everyone's going to have access to it because these yeah. zooms are recorded and they're posted on our website so that means everyone okay. has contact with zachary and can can continue these conversations um yeah. so i think we should all thank zachary for uh, connecting with us tonight and um you know hope to uh maybe actually see him in person sometime i don't know how that could be possible but he seems like he spent some happen. time in southern It'll california happen. and uh we hope to see you then and otherwise zoom with you soon all right thank you so much david everybody God bless you thank you okay Have thanks again evening. everyone for coming tonight Okay, we'll see you next time, I hope. <laughs> bye now. Bye-bye. Uh, David, you still there? I am still here. Uh, my picture is not on the screen. Yeah, so probably, um, Rich, um, the controls mute stopped it for a while. And we're still learning to control the Zoom appropriately. But we got Zoom bombed last month and we're trying to limit that possibility. And part of it happens just through people presenting themselves. So uh, you probably got caught up, but Don, um, you know, my email is on the website. And if you wanna just maybe suggest some times we could chat, I'd be happy to chat with you. And I, Florence, I bet you, you, there's Don, he's, he's, now I'm back, picture's back, and you probably know each other, or knew each other in the past, and maybe no, need to be Don reacquainted, was your last because name? Don was a past, Einstein, oh. Einstein, oh, and you were a past president, yes, oh. mid, mid 70s, okay, um, I was president of the year of the second mushroom fair at the Arboretum. Hmm, okay. I think maybe I was not active with the club then. You were in and out. Yes. Do you remember Jim Teague? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I got him too. He's going to re-sign up. I just talked to him yesterday. Uh-huh. Well, the, um... There are a lot of people that are gone now. Yes, I, I guess um, it's corporate. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably remember Greg, right? Yes. Yeah. And I have not talked to him in ages. Um, well. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. It's good to see you. It's good to see you and good to see you're in good health. Yeah, it's nice that you came on, Don, and it's a pleasure to meet you. So I'll uh, get in touch with you and uh, give you some. Hope you'll stories. continue to to log on and yes. um, and share some of the past with us because I think people would appreciate that. Okay, bye bye everybody. Okay, bye. take care now. Thanks again, everyone. I'm gonna log off. Great program. Thanks again, Rich. Thank you, Rich. See you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. <laughs> Thanks for the, uh, rec and the more recent email as well. That's very helpful. <laughs> I thought it might be. There's too many Zooms. <laughs> I'm going to